Okay, we're back. We're okay, we're back. We're live. We're here for, here for America. MG in America. And we have not one, not one but two guys. <laughs> <laughs> the CEO, the you have the president. CEO, the president. You have uh, Lou, uh, Lou, uh, Lou, uh, Lou and his pictures on the screen right, 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 right now. And we also have Jeff Kissel, who joins us also by Skype audio. Welcome to the show, gentlemen. Wonderful to be here. I'm happy to be here. That's great. So uh, let's talk so, uh, about what's happening in MG. I know, I know, it's hard, you know, it's hard, hard not to talk about what's going on in Washington. Um, but there's also, um, things, but there's also energy, things happening in energy, even, 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 even as all the tumble happens in Washington. Uh, where, where, are uh, where, where are you guys located today, anyway? I'm at a friend's home. Uh, separating myself from a dinner party in Georgetown. <laughs> I'm missing the dessert. Wonderful. It's a lovely time of the year. So we we thought we would talk about things that we touched on before. That is, you know, the problem with tax reform and whether a tax on gas would help. Uh, Lou and I talked about that a few weeks ago, and I wonder if we could uh, visit that again and extend it. Do you still think that's so? Do you still think that's doable? Do you still still think that would work? And has the tax reform initiative changed so as to moot out that possibility? So uh, let's talk a little bit about the basis of tax reform. I'll just start. Uh, there are three aspects that people want to get out of tax reform. I think one is we want to get uh, an expansion of the national economy by getting uh, a, a kind of, a, let's say, a rationalization of the corporate tax structure. We get the corporate stru tax structure down. We get more direct investment. Uh, incentivizes more direct investment. We make us more competitive against our trading partners. And we get faster economic growth. Unfortunately, even with what we call dynamic scoring, uh, in which we get more revenues from rapid growth. We get more revenues from uh, uh, territorial treatment and a low green repatriating profit from abroad and, uh, and, and our other reforms. It doesn't make, it doesn't give you enough money to get a political consensus to drive the corporate rate down from say 35% Fifteen percent. Even if you also get rid of a lot of taxes, so you need another revenue source somewhere. And the Congress uh, played with something called the border adjustment tax, but that seems to be dead on the rival. Uh, people talk about a value-added tax. People talk about broadening the base, but it doesn't generate. So the, the remaining item that's on the table is the gasoline tax maybe diesel as well. And if you look at the federal tax for gasoline, it's been stuck at about 18.4 cents since 1993. And if you were to adjust that for inflation, it would rise to about 31 cents. And that could generate over 10 years, uh, probably 150 to $200 billion. And it's not enough, but it might be enough for the Congress to go forward and feel good about putting a long-term tax reform in place. My view is we have to get the corporate rate down if we're going to get higher rates than we get on the program. Well, let me, let me ask one, one question that strikes me is, you know, uh, I, I, I'm, I must say that I do not agree with very much that it's doing. And uh, I keep wondering whether we need tax reform. Uh, just as I wonder whether we need to repeal Obamacare. But um, I wonder, do we need tax reform? You know, he's, he wants to spend $54 billion more for military. He's got a plan for all kinds of infrastructure. I'm not sure what the, uh, you know, the situation is uh, in, in the case of the Mexican wall. Um, but he's got plans to spend enormous amounts of money. Um, wouldn't wouldn't uh, another possibility be not to spend that money? Um, well, I think the Congress is going to have a lot to say about that. But they're not going to spend all that money. The president might propose a budget, but only the Congress authorizes the budget. Mm -hmm. He's not going to get all the cuts he wants, and he's not going to get all the spending he wants. Mm -hmm. But a, a kind of fundamental plank 
of the Republican Party for many years, not just the Republicans, by the way, you might argue that some, you know, enlightened Democrats, let's say, are saying, well, you know, why do we have such low economic growth? And you might argue it's demographics, you might argue the, the you know, people are lazy, you know, we can pass a drug test, lots of things. But we do have, by historical standards, low productivity and low economic growth. How do you, and, uh, Lou, how do you reconcile that? How do you reconcile that with, with two things that are happening right now? Number one is um, unemployment is way down. Um, and secondly is new jobs for college graduates, um, you know, the, the wages that are paid, the salaries that are paid are, are way up. And the market yeah, until... Both of, those, both, of those, uh, both of those conclusions are facts are correct. But the question is, and the answer is, is that there's still a lot of participation rate of the 25 to 65 year olds in the national economy. Mm -hmm. And that number is still at an extremely low level by historical standards. So even if I take out the old folks and the young people that shouldn't be working, we still have a segment of the population which should be in the labor force and are not. And we need to find out why that's the case. And I think. You know, there's lots of debate about this, but a fundamental issue is you know, we're getting good performance on the consumption side, but we're just not getting, a le getting the level of direct business investment to deliver the productivity and to deliver the wage growth. It's unemployment is one thing, but we're not getting wage growth, and we need productivity for that. Mm -hmm. So I, I think this is a real issue. Actually, this is what, part of the reason why Trump won, right? Yeah. A lot of people, a lot of people, which, which are the traditional Democratic constituents, which were ignored by their leadership in many different ways, uh, decided to vote for the, this guy instead of Hillary. Well, let me throw one, one other thing into the pot here. If you talk about increasing the federal gas tax, I mean, that, that has a positive effect in the sense that it probably incentivizes renewables. But um, the, the states, the states need money, too. And for that matter, Puerto Rico needs money and Hawaii needs money. Hawaii's not in good shape at all. And I'm sure there are other, you know, states around that are in bad shape. And this is a source of income for them, too. And I expect some of them are likewise going to be raising the gas tax. Um, and then you have two increases in the gas tax, one federal, one state. So what, what's the upshot of that, to have them both go up at the same time? Um, I, I guess it still incentivizes renewables, but it may have a, a bad effect on the public or in some way on the economy. Jeff, what do you think? Well, I, I think you've got to look at it um, differently. When we have had, for the last 30-plus years, Democratic administrations and then the odd Republican that stuck in there, the tax structure was looked at as a behavior modification tool. It was a, an instrument of social policy. Yes. The Trump administration is looking at it in an entirely different way. They're looking at it as an engine to drive the economy and nothing else. I think that might be too abrupt a transition to get anything done. That's the real problem. So, you know, you have to get people to your point of view gradually in this world. You can't take them and jerk them there. I, I can't tell you whether, from an energy policy standpoint, the, the change in the gas tax is going to do much. I can tell you, however, Lou can give us the figures to support it, that the fact that petroleum and the hydrocarbon complex has gotten cheaper and cheaper relative to the gross domestic product of the United States. That is a very important economic driver of, of the American industrial and social complex. And I don't think it's at all unreasonable for Congress, again, if they abandon some the taxation as an instrument of social policy, to say, hey, we can take a piece of that and we can apply it to the needs of this economy for investment in infrastructure, investment in roadways, and yes, regrettably, investment in defense. 
Well, Lou, you know, you sent us some, uh, some slides, some graphs. Uh, we'll yeah, put them on the screen now, and I'll tell you what's on the screen, and you can help us understand them. So why don't, we show, why don't we show some of those graphs now? Here's a graph called Carbon Tax on Transportation Fuels, 2017. Uh, I, this is one of the favorite, my favorite graphs of all time. Because everyone talks about we need a carbon tax for, uh, you know, so people will not use so much fossil fuel. And some fossil fuels are not taxed very much. You know, for example, natural gas or coal. But actually, transportation fuels are taxed. So we went and took the existing tax structure, uh, excise taxes at the state and the federal level, and then if we calculated these taxes in terms of the uh, per ton basis of carbon, how much would they be? And they're coming in at about $50 a ton, which is interesting enough, if you think about crude oil, 70 to 80 percent of crude oil is used in transportation fuel. So it would be incorrect to say we don't have a carbon tax. Uh, it would be incorrect to say we don't have taxes on transportation fuel. We do. And they're about $50 a ton, which, by the way, is substantially above the Obama administration's estimate of the social cost of carbon. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I just, uh, we've gotten so much hate mail over that chart, <laughs> but it turns out it's just the math. <laughs> okay, uh, we, have, we have one more slide that you sent along, and I, let's take a look at that one too, and I'll, uh, I don't know if you recall the title of it, but I, I'll be, uh, it's Federal and State yeah. Gasoline Taxes. And it shows, uh, I guess, both, um, uh, let's see, I, I can't tell the difference. There's a blue. So it shows both state and federal taxes. And the states have been moving their taxes up. I have another chart I did for Kenya which shows some of the states pay a very high cost for, for gasoline. Uh, Hawaii has a high cost. Uh, California has a high cost, not entirely due to taxes, also due to regulation. But the federal excise tax, has not been adjusted for inflation since 1993. So it's the, the value of that revenue to fix roads and all the things you want to do with that has been eroded almost in half. So that chart shows you what the tax should be if it were just adjusted for inflation. If it were adjusted for inflation, the tax on the federal tax should not be 18.4 cents, but 31 cents. You know, it, it strikes me that, um, you know, it's going up. And I think um, if not this particular initiative, other initiatives will force it up. Um, the need for government to have more money, and it's a, it's a good target. Um, so, I, I, I want to talk about just point. It's very regressive. Yes. So any such procedure should, uh, should do something for lower income groups, either a rebate or something. And I'll tell you a very interesting anecdote when I was in California last year. The Latino caucus of the Democratic Party went to Governor Brown and said, you know, uh, our people have a real hard time living on the coast. It's very expensive. But if you keep increasing gasoline taxes, they won't be able to drive to the coast to work. <laughs> so there is a kind of backlash coming on this, these taxes. Yeah. So how do you how do you accommodate that? How do you uh, you I think know? You have to rebate this to lower income groups. So in the t in the the very same tax reform bill, you have to give a break to the lower income groups. I think you do. I, I, I think this will make it more palatable. Yeah. Probably not bad public policy either. Is there anything we can do to refine the gas tax? In other words, right now it's regressive. It's a sort of a flat tax on the amount of gas you buy. Um, I'm wondering if there's anything we can do to, you know, make it more sophisticated. In other words, maybe... Well, one of the interesting problems is as we produce more electric vehicles and all of these cars with brakes, the states are figuring out, hey, these electric cars are not paying road taxes. <laughs> mm -hmm. We need to get road taxes from them. And that's where you're going to start seeing higher registration fees and other forms of taxation to collect the taxes from electric vehicles. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, interesting. We're going to take a short break, you guys. When we come back, I'm going to talk about uh, Hawaii. I want to talk about the, um, the, the fuel tax in Hawaii um, and how it affects transportation. Um, and it's another issue that is very timely. We'll be right back uh, with Lou Pugliarese and Jeff Kissel of ePrink. Aloha. My name is Stephen Philip Katz. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, and I'm the host of Shrink Wrap Hawaii, where I talk to other shrinks. Did you ever want to get your head shrunk? Well, this is the best place to come to pick one. I've been doing this. We must have 60 shows with a whole bunch of shrinks that you can look at. I'm here on Tuesdays at 3 o'clock every other Tuesday. I hope you are too. Aloha. Freedom. Is it a feeling? Is it a place? Is it an idea? At Dive Heart, we believe freedom is all of these and more, regardless of your ability. Dive Heart wants to help you escape the bonds of this world and defy gravity. Since 2001, Dive Heart has helped children, adults, and veterans of all abilities go where they have never gone before. Dive Heart has helped them transition to their new normal. Search DiveHeart.org and share our mission with others. And in the process, help people of all abilities imagine the possibilities in their lives. Lou Puyarisi and Jeff Kissel of ePrink um, on the East Coast, I guess I would say, uh, whether it's Washington or New York. Um, and the, the second part of our discussion on energy in America here is uh, what about Hawaii? What about a fuel tax in Hawaii? Where are we? Um, what can we do? Uh, what can we do about aviation, for example? Jeff, can you give the, the landscape on that? Well, Hawaii has a number of ways to tax its fuel, and people don't see them all. Clearly, they do it at the pump, but also Hawaii has what they call the barrel tax. So every every barrel of imported oil, and it's all imported, obviously, um, is taxed at at a specific rate. That goes into the power generation sector. It goes into the transportation, surface transportation, and air transportation, as well as marine transportation fuels. So there's a lot of money taken out of fossil fuels before they get into the economy in Hawaii. Now, that unfortunately has not seemed to alter behavior very much in terms of driving. We still have a lot of people alone in their cars. If when we're, we're building a rail system, uh, I'm not going to comment on how successful that enterprise is at, at present. There are a lot of work. You're a smart oh. man, Jeff. You're a smart man. But I, <laughs> let me tell you this, Jeff. This is very important for people to start to think about. If you want to measure anything, you got to start at one end or another. You got a piece of string. You can't figure out how long it is if you measure just the middle. You got to. You can't guess from the ends. We know for sure that cars get approximately 20 miles to the gallon. You know, some get more, some get less. We know that there's very little we can do at a reasonable cost to move 20 miles to the gallon up to 40 miles to the gallon. But I can tell you how to get 40 miles to the gallon at no additional cost. Yes. And that puts somebody in the passenger seat. <laughs> and, and, and that's where I think our, our leadership and our government has, has missed and is missing a really important opportunity. If you want to change behavior, you can't just keep beating on the auto companies. You have got to do something to alter behavior that, that will drive mileage up, improve mileage. Airlines have got a terrific incentive to do that because every dollar that they save on fuel goes straight to their bottom lines because airports and airlines are running at absolute maximum capacity. So they're raising prices. And if they save costs, they don't have to pass it along to their customers. Fuel yes. is the biggest area for cost. Yes. Our generation is not so motivated because they get to pass along all of their fuel costs to their customers. So if you, if you want to drive savings in the economy and have more money available for roads, and bridges, and, and education and hospitals, you've got to do things that will allow you to free up more money. One of them is to double the miles per gallon by putting somebody in the passenger seat. Now, uh, I, I like renewables. I, I am heavily involved in the renewables industry. But I will tell you 
that renewables come at a cost. And unless you pay for the renewables, you're not going to get them in the system. So what we're doing in Hawaii, as we are systematically killing the solar and wind, wind industries, because we have refused to invest in our grid, so the grid can take more renewable electricity, is we have actually raised the cost of renewable energy and fossil fuel energy. And, and that's at the expense of roads, bridges, education, hospitals, food, and the other necessities for our citizens to live in. Yeah. Well, so if, if let's, let's dwell for a minute on the idea of somehow incentivizing more than one person to ride uh, in a fossil car or whatever kind of car. How do you do that? How do you change conduct? Um, what's the you know, way you set it out, you know, theoretically, and, and how do you implement that plan so it works? You've got to start telling the truth. The truth is we have about 15% renewables in our electric supply on the average. That means 85% of the fuel an electric car uses is fossil fuel. It's not renewable, clean electricity. So what you've got to do is you've got to say, in Hawaii, we're going to treat all transportation vehicles alike. Now, there is a cost to using a transportation vehicle that people should be willing to pay, in my opinion. So if, if you can do that with a number of conventional vehicles, congestion charges, electronic transponders for toll, you can get time of use charges on the roadways. Then you eliminate the issue of, uh, of the inequality and the regressiveness of the tax because you can actually give people a rebate on their income tax based on their, their road usage. Well, that's, uh, but how, you need some kind of technology to do that. How would that technology work? I, I, you know, I live on the mainland. I've got a little transponder stuck to my uh, windshield. Every time I go past a sensor in a road, if I have to pay a charge, it charges me. It's got a little selector switch. If I got more than one person in my vehicle, I put it to two or three, and I pay a lower charge. This is you know, I don't think this is a technology issue. This is a political issue. We have the technology. Well, but it costs money to, to deliver that technology. Uh, although I, I have to say that in the larger sense, um, that's a small price to pay to achieve, um, you know, a better system. I know that uh, in Singapore, they've, they've had this kind of thing for a long time. You, you, you drive past uh, with a chip or a sensor, and it knows, and it, it charges you, and you get a bill at the end of the month um, uh, for every toll road or every road that's chargeable that you might pass on. But, but if you did that in the U.S., uh, it would, you know, I suppose it would be appropriate in every state, not only Hawaii, but uh, it would cost a bundle of money. I'd like to be the guy who owns the electronics firm. Well, you, you probably are one of the guys that owns it if you own a mutual fund, because a lot of people are doing that in business. The big companies of America are doing it. The fact of the matter is this technology is, is terribly inexpensive. I've got a chip on the front of my bumper that opens the gate to the development that I live in. That chip, if it cost $10, I would be shocked. So there's no problem with with doing it from a physical standpoint or a technological standpoint. There is an issue because if you're going to make me carry a passenger in my car, you're infringing on my space, and that's politics. That's what we have to overcome. You can no longer improve the system if you want to deliver higher miles, miles per gallon by changing the engine configuration. Do you think people, change. you think, Jeff, do you think people in Hawaii would oppose that? I mean, there have been various efforts where the government, you know, uh, laid down some rule or another to require car, carpooling. 
And in each case um, that I'm aware of, the car, the, the, these initiatives have not worked, simply because the government has not enforced them. And it hasn't been a matter of money. It's been other things, but not money for the individual driver. But if I take your approach, your, you know, your idea, your model that you just described, it seems to me people in Hawaii would, would agree and would go along with it. Don't you think so? Or do you think there'd be opposition? It's been tried. Like you said, there's very little that's new. You're not old enough to remember it, uh, Jay, but there was a transfer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. By the name of E. L. V. Wright. Sure. And in, the, in the late 1970s, he um, did a bunch of studies to determine how you could actually limit the road miles of vehicles and make those more efficient. Those studies are valid today. And what you, what you can do is set a goal for passenger miles. Just like the airlines have revenue passenger miles, you can have vehicle passenger miles. And you could, if, if we had an enlightened and, and cohesive leadership, you could actually convince people that we could set statewide goals for, for vehicle passenger miles, just like renewable energy, provide incentives and disincentives for achieving that. Well, I don't think it's good by regulation. We should do with economic intent. Right. Well, it's, 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 it strikes me that that is a pretty good way to approach things because, um, you know, the bottom line of it is that we, we will limit the amount of unnecessary vehicles on the road and limit the amount of unnecessary driving on the road, and um, we won't have as much congestion, and hopefully our roads won't deteriorate at the same rate they deteriorate now. So um, I guess the question I would put to you both is, um, is that, that initiative, does that, I guess your initiative as you described it, Jeff, would, would not involve uh, necessarily an increase in the, in the general tax on gas, the state tax on, on fossil fuel. Um, in fact, it might expand it in some way to electric cars as well. Um, it, will it would bring more revenue in, but the important point to remember is is that that kind of a tax will actually change more behavior than driving behavior. It'll change housing behavior. It, it, will, it will change recreation behavior. And in doing so, we will really be making better use of our fuel and limiting not the absolute amount of carbon we, we emit, an absolute amount of fuel we use. We're going to be limiting the per person fuel and we're going to be driving ourselves to a more sustainable economy overall. Yeah, interesting idea. So, Lou, my question to you is, if other states adopted programs like that, <clears throat> could these programs coexist? Could they live in the, in the same world as the, the idea of increasing the um, you know, the barrel tax, increasing the tax on a gas, a, a gallon of gas uh, for purposes of tax reform to, you know, balance the tax reform. Can we do both you at know, the same I mean, time? I think the tax reform is based on a political problem. How do we get enough revenue to lubricate the deal? You know, so we can get it from other sources as well, but the gasoline tax is kind of a big target out there because it hasn't been raised for a long time. <laughs> It's also very difficult to do. It's not, any, it's not a lot easier than the other tax. But I do think there's huge benefit to getting the corporate tax down, to getting that rate at a more competitive level. Uh, we need the economic growth in this country. We live in an opportunity economy, not in a distributed economy. So. And that's a lot of the dilemma in the last election. You know, there wasn't enough growth. People yeah. were pretty upset. Yeah, yeah, and that, that that really undermines the the national direction that way. Uh, we need more. We need more more money. We need more money in the economy, and arguably, we also need more money in the government. And that's the mission here in the 21st century. Well, thank you both. Thank you, Lou Pugliaresi, and thank you, Jeff Kissel, both of EPRINC. Really appreciate the discussion, uh, even at far ends of the country this way. And I hope we can talk again in the next couple of weeks. Uh, and the best to both of you. Thanks so much. Aloha, Jay. Mahalo. Aloha. Aloha both.